it is time to pull apart this transmission and extract the factory diff. Now, I probably wouldn't even attempt this on a transmission that was worth a lot of money or particularly rare or particularly complex. This is sort of as simple as it gets in terms of front wheel drive gearboxes. So this is the one that's gonna be the learning experience. Uh, the good news as well is if, if something goes really wrong or this one happens to be damaged or something is like just not right with it. Uh, these are really cheap at Wreckers because they're in every stock boring CH Lancer um, from pretty much 2006 or 2000 to 2007 or something like that. So there's heaps and heaps of them. Um, really common gearbox as well. Actually, uh, these are the equivalent to what's in the DSMs that America has. Uh, so again, even more common and good for aftermarket parts. So gonna rip it apart. Gearboxes can look pretty intimidating when you do get them apart. The selectors, synchros and gears all mesh together to fit a fairly complex system into a small space. It also has to be strong enough to withstand the day-to-day -day abuse of going to the shops and dropping the kids off at the pool. The mechanism that actually changes the gears when you pull on the shifter is bolted to the side of the case and the whole unit needs to be removed in order to get the gearbox apart. Losing bits out of a gearbox isn't an option, so it's important to keep track of every little last piece. With that out of the way, I can remove the bolts from around the case, including two sneaky ones on the inside. Factory Workshop Manual is a great asset, especially if it's your first time like it is mine. It helps you stay one step ahead of any gotchas that can otherwise ruin your day if you bend something or break it while trying to remove something. Some of the sort of aftermarket manuals probably won't go into the kind of depth required to do a job this big. They'll just say, replace the manual transaxle. But a factory workshop manual, if you can get your hands on it, and that can be tricky, um, will show you the full overhaul procedure because when these cars were new, it would have been worthwhile overhauling them. And also I think they need to actually give people that information in case they want to repair pieces inside this thing so they don't have to buy a brand new one because potentially a $10 bearing or a $20 seal could be the only thing that's required to make your gearbox work again. Um, I've managed to do one of the trickiest bits, which is getting this cap off um, that lives in the top there. It's pretty innocuous looking. You wouldn't really think that it's so important, but it turns out that it is. Um, that one's in okay condition. Getting it out is really tricky. Um, these are probably consumables. If you are doing this in a, um, in a dealer, you'd probably just have heaps of these on hand. So I'm gonna have to try and get one of them. Um, but this one's actually not too bad. It could probably go again. Uh, so now I need to release uh, a circlip that's on here and then remove some other bits and pieces just so I can see what I'm doing and then we can separate the cases. One of the less fun sides about setting up a home garage is slowly discovering all the tools that you don't have um, when there's one bolt on the entire job that requires something a bit strange. In this case, it's a T50 Torx, which is all well and good, except I only had a T40 as a maximum. So that should let us release what I believe is the reverse idler gear. Um, and that is currently preventing it from lifting up. So hopefully this bolt out, case off, and then we're in business. Oh, nailed it. Even the most basic front wheel drive transmission is an impressive piece of engineering when you consider how much wear and tear it is subjected to. Old dirty oil can kill these things fast when it gets in between all the tightly meshed gears. So maintenance and mechanical sympathy is the key to a long life. Overall, it looks pretty good. This is the bit that matters though, and that is the diff. Uh, so that's the bit we've now got to try and extract, which probably means removing a bunch of this stuff as well. Um, and then the diff should lift out. Then the next challenge is getting the bearings off and possibly replacing the bearings depending on their condition and how easy they are, how easy they are to get. I've also on a bit of a deadline because our battle date is looming and uh, I need to have my car back together. So that may just get thrown back in and then then we'll be putting the box back in the car, if it all goes back together, or going to the wreckers and buying a new gearbox. 
So a bit of good news is that I did find the original workshop manual for a Lancer. The bad news is the gearbox that it covers that I was following is not actually the same as this and you don't realize until you go to take the diff out and it's completely different. And I forgot one of the most basic things when you're working on an engine or a gearbox that you haven't encountered before is to look for the actual code. Engines have them, 4G69. Gearboxes have them too. In this case, it's a F. Uh, F5M42, which is really common. It's in gearboxes from Mitsubishi all over the world, all sorts of front wheel drive cars. The good news is with that information, it opens up all this extra resource of videos and photos and forum posts and stuff where you can get the sort of info that you need when you're trying to do an upgrade such as this. So I've now worked out that all I gotta do is undo the three bolts that sort of hold this whole assembly in, the shift rails, the input shaft, the output shaft, and all this should come out as one big assembly and the diff is just free floating in there and I should be able to just pull it out. Gearboxes, like engines, are precision items, but they're also designed to be serviced. So as long as you don't yank on anything too hard, you'll probably be okay. A full gearbox rebuild involves replacing gears, synchros, and bearings, but in our case, it's just the diff that we're interested in. A good tip is to check the diff center on one of the drive shafts so you don't work out afterwards that it's wrong once you've already put everything in the car. This is a fairly exciting part of the swap. The good news is we have the original diff out and we have the new LSD and it looks like it's gonna fit. It is a very common gearbox, so there's a very good chance it will. So one thing you will notice is different is this thing. Now that is not where any drive or power comes from the car. That is just to run this, which is the Speedo. This thing sort of sits like that against the gear and as it spins, that turns. It's a little sensor for speedo. Um, we're not too worried about speedo. We can get that kind of data off drive shafts and use the Haltech and some other things to make that work, including a Haltech dash, which would tell us the speed. You can even use things like GPS sensors. So it's really, a lot of the time, not really worth doing all this when you can fix it with electronics for maybe 100 or 200 bucks. Now that I've got the bearing off, I'll be able to use the number that's on the back of it because even though this is a diff that's assembled by Mitsubishi and Mitsubishi have their own part numbers for this particular item, a lot of the time they've obviously got companies that make them make the parts for them. In this case, it's a Koyo, um, high capacity LM501349-N. Uh, there'll be a number for the inner and the outer race of the bearing. Removing it like that, um, very little chance of getting it out without actually damaging it, even though this is in pretty good condition basically until I removed it. Um, the good thing about this though is you can take it to a bearing shop and it's highly likely they'll be able to find one that's equivalent. Uh, so if I can't get a genuine Mitsubishi one, it looks like I won't be able to get one in time, I may be able to go to a bearing supplier and grab one tomorrow. So that's the plan. First thing in the morning, bearing shop, whack the new bearings on, try and put this diff puzzle back together and throw it in the car. There are two bits of excellent news. One is that I have the bearings, they have arrived. Um, and they look like the right ones, which is awesome. The second is that it's day daytime again. Um, but the next step now is to attempt to get these bearings onto the new diff. There's a bunch of possible ways to install diffs and bearings. The number one most successful method being get a pro to do it. But if you're like me and enjoy the learning experience and are prepared to head to the wreckers with your tail between your legs for a second go when you get it wrong, it can be great fun to do it yourself. The second method for installing bearings is to use heat. By heating up the bearing, you expand it ever so slightly, which will allow it to slip over the shaft. This isn't a great idea on bearings that are pre-packed full of grease or have fragile rubber parts, but it's a tried and tested method from way back. The third option is to use pressure. A hydraulic press is a no-nonsense approach, but it isn't always appropriate and you run the risk of doing irreversible damage to either your bearings or worse, your brand new diff, if you don't get it lined up perfectly. I'm going to do all these methods, except of course the first one. With the bearings mounted onto the diff without any issues, I can remove the other half of the bearing that sits in the gearbox case. This doesn't require any extreme processes as they just sit snug. The seals also need to be knocked out so they can be cleaned up or replaced. With that done, it's time to remove the ring gear off the original diff and transfer it onto the new limited slip wave track.
the old diff has been removed, the ring gear has been removed from the old diff, the ring gear is now on the wave track, and this is all ready to be reassembled. So I'm gonna clear some space, get rid of any tools I don't need, any nuts and bolts that shouldn't be here, and try and Lego it back together. Cleaning up mid-job ensures that no old dirt or objects get mixed up with your freshly installed parts. Brake cleaner is perfect for removing old dirt and grease off the casing and the internal magnet that catches any metal shavings that circulate in the oil as the gears slowly wear away at each other. A toothbrush makes this job even easier. Next, the new diff and ring gear can be placed into the bearings in the bottom half of the case. Then it's the tricky part, which is getting the input and output shafts, selectors, rails and every other little part held together with just hopes and dreams back into the case without dropping anything. This might take a few goes and in this case, all the parts Lego back together fairly easily if you get it wrong, so patience is key. A soft mallet can be used to help see things but it should only need the lightest of taps to sort it out. And just like that, we have half a working gearbox. The next job is to secure the gears back into the case, clean up the other half, apply some grey sealant and drop the top back into place. gearbox is back together correctly I hope uh, the only thing that is missing so far is this little sort of freeze plug thing that Mitsubishi tell you is completely sacrificial uh, so I'm probably gonna have to get myself a new one of them to seal up the box now you can do that with a box in the car which is really good so I can just continue and the last thing I will need to do is put one of these in before I can fill it up with oil but it's all back together I gotta wait for the sealant to dry and while I'm waiting for that I'll get started on the clutch in the car Next, I'm gonna remove the old clutch. It smells like a train. It smells like friction material that's been burnt. Uh, it's within an inch of its life. So I'm gonna pull this off. We'll have a bit of a close look at it and then we can throw the new clutch and flywheel on. So much train brake. Oh, wow. I've pulled out the old clutch and what I noticed straight away is that this clutch may have had a little bit of life left in it back when it was just a naturally aspirated uh, car for getting around town and picking the kids up from school. Um, since it's been on the dyno, or potentially before that if someone had a happy clutch foot, uh, there's a lot of sort of scoring and this is really sort of burnt out, um, having been overheated a couple of times by us on the dyno. So unfortunately that's going to have to go in the bin and we're going to have to put something a little bit more heavy duty in, which in this case is this clutch here, which is an extreme clutch. Uh, pretty much you can tell straight away how much more aggressive that is. It looks like some of the other putt clutches that we've put in cars in the past. The center's a lot more solid. The springs are much more chunky and there'll be more pressure coming from this pressure plate as well, uh, which will help clamp the clutch down to the flywheel. And speaking of flywheels, I've also got myself an aftermarket Fidanza 
flywheel, which you go on the car. It comes as part of a kit with this clutch, uh, which um, helps a great deal. It comes from RPW in Western Australia, who have done a bunch of these cars and made them fast. So it was a bit of a formula to get all this that they've had working up and over 300 kilowatts. So fingers crossed, this will hold the power. Uh, the next step is to pull the factory flywheel off, get this bad boy on there, get the clutch on there, and then once the gearbox is all back together and sorted, get that back into the car and go do some skids. A trap for new players is that although the flywheel bolts look like they're in an even pattern, one of them is offset so that the flywheel will only bolt on in one orientation. The flywheel comes supplied with new bolts to suit the thicker material. Loctite is a good idea and a torque wrench is an absolute must to make sure this thing is on nice and tight and prevent an accidental trip into space. With the new clutch attached to the engine, the gearbox gets a new clutch release bearing and the box goes onto the gearbox jack so it can be fitted back into the car. This is quite hard to do by yourself with a gearbox jack and hoist and even harder to do by yourself on the floor, so patience and a few goes may be necessary. The car is almost back together after a pretty significant uh, amount of mechanical work to get to that diff, to get the box out, to reseal everything, to remount it. Um, pretty epic job. So I've got fingers and just about everything else crossed that I don't have to pull it out again, but it is a possibility when you're messing with this amount of stuff. Um, just about done for today. Now there's a couple of seals on that gearbox. Pretty old and cruddy looking. So I'll probably try and order another set of those. Uh, I might get them in a day or two. Um, but tomorrow, all that's left to do is fill it back up full of oil. Now, the wave track uses just the standard factory fill, so whether that's GL4, in this case it's GL5. Uh, the diff doesn't actually work as well if you start putting all like friction modifiers in it and fancy limited slip diff oil that is the case with other kinds of diffs. Uh, so I've got to get myself uh, some Castrol gear oil to put into this thing. Then I can put the cooler pipes back on, battery back on. I've got a few other things to tidy up, like the shifter doesn't work properly and the power for the wideband's not quite right. So once I've got it all back together, I can troubleshoot that stuff and then I can hit the dyno. There's definitely something to be said for the familiarity you get with a car you've owned for such a long time, especially if it's been apart as many times as this nugget. Being that we've removed all the factory plastic intakes and associated plumbing, getting the alloy cooler pipes back on is a super easy job. The last thing to go in is the battery, which is tied down and then reconnected, ready to start the car. All right, this is the moment of truth. Put the battery in. I'm gonna start it up and put it in gear, see if the wheels turn, see if the clutch works, and see if we've got a limited slip diff. All right, here we go. Clutch feels good. That's neutral. Here we go. First gear. Hey! It works. Well, it appears to work. So there it is. That's 
how to spend way too long putting an LSD into your front wheel drive Evo. Lancer, not Evo. I mean, well, sort of big block Lancer. All that's left to do now is take it to the dyno. On the next episode of Mighty Car Mods, I head to the dyno with a few mates to see if my $400 Wrecker motor is any match for the mighty 4G63 powering Twisted. Two, four, two, seven, two, seven.